I want to give a big shout out to Pastor Joel for getting us started in our James series, the religion series, and uh, we're going to continue that today. It's going to be a 10-part series through the book of James, religion. You'll notice the use of real there, not just religion, but real religion, and that's what we're going to be talking about today in the first half of James chapter 2. So let's have a quick prayer and get into the text. Father in heaven, great to be back here with my people down under. And uh, just looking forward to what you have in store for us today in the text, we turn our attention to you. May you, by the Spirit, turn your attention to us, Father. We know that you are, you are never not aware of us. Every moment you are aware of us. But, Father, we're praying for something very specific here. We're praying for an infilling of your Spirit, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of humility, the Spirit of malleability, so that we won't just learn intellectually, but we will move emotionally and physically. Uh, Father, this is a book that just calls us to practical, primitive religion, to a, to a faith that has feet and to a lesson that has legs on it. So be with us now, Father, as we go to James, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. All right, let's go to the book of James, James chapter 1. Thank you, Joel, for getting us started with the first two. And thank you, Gordon. Our, ser- our sermon today, I'm not really happy with the sermon title. I was trying to come up with something really clever but sometimes descriptive is better than clever. It's titled, The Rich, Poor, and the Liberated Lawful. The Rich, Poor, and the Liberated Lawful. We will be in the first 13 verses of James chapter 2. Now, I know that Joel has already spent some time sort of giving background to the book of James, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I did want to give a few slides, some of the material that Joel has covered, and some additional material just to sort of set the larger context, context for why we're in the book of James and why we've titled the series, not religion, but real religion. Okay, first of all, how many of you have read through the book of James in preparation for this series, or just in the last year, you've read through the book of James? Raise your hands. Great. Love to see every hand go up next week. As you read the book of James, you get this sense that James' letter has a kind of Old Testament flavor and feel. It feels not unlike the book of Proverbs, right? Really simple, pithy, punchy, powerful, And it does not go in, it's not like Pauline, it's not like Galatians, it's not like Romans where you have these long, verbose, uh, you know, digressions and explanations. James is right to the point, very pithy, very pointed, and very powerful. It feels, again, like, kind of like the book of Proverbs, and there are a number of proverbial sayings. Now, one of the statements in the commentaries that Joel and I have been reading in preparation for the series that just jumped out at me, and I was so thrilled to see, Joel, that you used this statement is from Douglas Moo's commentary on the book of James. And he says, James depends more than any other New Testament author on the teaching of who? On the teaching of Jesus. That's a fascinating and big, broad statement. I love what he goes on to say. Moo says he weaves Jesus' teaching into the very fabric of his own instruction. The author of the letter seems to have been so soaked in the atmosphere and specifics of Jesus' teaching that he can reflect them almost unconsciously. And when you read the book of James, especially if you're familiar with the Gospels, you're just like, man, that sounds like, the, that sounds like Matthew. That sounds like Mark. That sounds like Luke. And that's what Moo means. He, he's saying here that, that there's, there's not so much exposition about Jesus as we find, for example, in the teachings of Paul. What we find here is just this almost unconscious, breathless, easy articulation of the teachings of Jesus. And we're going to see that again and again and again in the writing of James. One of the things that Joel pointed out is the historical context in which the book of James, unlike, for example, the letter to the Galatians or the letter to the church in Ephesus, is not to a specific location, to a specific people. The book of James is what Bible scholars call a general epistle, but it's actually a little more specific than that. In the opening section there, and Joel dealt with this, what we have is what's called the diaspora, the diaspora. These are Jews that have been scattered And these various Jews find themselves in a new situation, in a new homeland, in a new context, most of them working certainly for non-Christians in most cases, and many of them even for non-Jewish peoples, right? And so the people to whom James writes are displaced, they are very many of them likely impoverished, and they certainly are persecuted, and we'll get to that at the end. In fact, we're going to talk more about that in just a second. Very likely the context in which we find the dispersion of the people to whom James is writing is found right in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. 
Now, one of the fascinating things about the book of James is that it's a very early picture and letter from, from early Christianity. This letter could have been written as early as A.D. 43 or 44. Now, to put that in historical context is difficult because when we think about historical figures, whether a Caesar or an Alexander the Great, often the information that we have about these people is centuries removed from the actual situation, the person that's being described. Here Jesus has died in A.D. 31, 3031, and now we have this early window, this letter that, that sort of reveals to us what Christianity looked like less than 15 years later. It's really astonishing, and that's why when you read the book of James, it has a very Jewish feel, a very Old Testament feel. And uh, the reason for that is, is that this is actually before the meeting at... Um, Jerusalem in Acts 15. We'll get to that in just a second. Mu again, he says, we can well imagine these early Jewish Christians leaving their homes, trying to establish new lives in new and often hostile environments. And because of this sense of dislocation, losing some of their spiritual moorings, right? So they've moved to a new location. They're kind of reinventing themselves. And some of the things that maybe would have been easier in their local context are becoming harder in this new situation in which they find themselves. James, as their pastor, would naturally want to encourage and to admonish them. And that's what we find in the book of James. So he's writing to them and he's like, hey, I'm seeing some slipping. I'm seeing some things that are concerning to me. And so he writes in that context. This is what I was just mentioning a moment ago. The letter of, the letter of James is actually written before the church council in Acts chapter 15, which is remarkable. The church council in Acts 15 probably took place in A.D. 50, maybe as early as A.D. 49. So what we have here is, if you remember, the big point about what's taking place in the Jerusalem council was the integration of Gentiles into a largely Jewish commu community. That was the big tectonic shift in early Christianity, of course, because you had a Jewish Messiah that was spoken about in Jewish scriptures that was being preached and believed by Jewish people, and then you have this influx of Gentiles. Okay, this is before that. Okay, it's not before the Gentiles are coming in, but it's before the church has had a meeting. And so one of the things that we find in James's book and in some of James's theology, I don't want to call it clunky because I don't think it's clunky, but it certainly is not as massaged and as nuanced as the writings of, for example, Paul. Right? At this point, James and Paul have not had time to sit down and to discuss and to better understand. In fact, it's entirely possible that up to this point, James knows precious little about the Apostle Paul's ministry. That counsel is not going to happen for another five or six years. And that's why when we read the book of James, it has this Old Testament feel. Here's one case in point. The name Jesus only occurs twice in the book of James. Two times. In ch one, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and in chapter 2, verse 1. And that's it. Where if you're reading, for example, the writings of Paul, it's like Jesus, 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 Christ, Christ, Christ. That is not to say that James has a lower Christology than Paul does, but again, that he just sort of absorbs almost unconsciously, almost in an ambient sense, the teachings of Jesus. Remember, this is James' brother, not Peter, James, and John James. Joel discussed that. And he just exudes a very Christ-centered teaching. Okay. A few more words of introduction. James' letter to the scattered tribes is fiercely practical, it is functional, and it is very ethical. Ethical, practical, and functional. And that's what we're going to talk about now. In the course, now this is new material, getting into James chapter 2. In the course of the book of James, what we're going to find is that James, as these people have come to a new situation, new context, trying to reinvent themselves, again, according to Mu, they have perhaps begun to lose some of their spiritual moorings. You can imagine if you moved from your local Kingscliff Church here, a good solid church where you've got good friends, good community, good context, good situation, and you moved to a situation where you didn't have the support group, you didn't have this group of people around you, what would happen invariably is that you would slowly absorb yourself into that new situation. Hopefully it was another good church situation, but if it wasn't, you might find yourself, we would say a, a common modern term would be backsliding, sort of accommodating yourself into this new situation. James sees that. And he doesn't have a problem with some level of cultural accommodation, but what James sees that really concerns him is a worldly accommodation, the church sliding into worldliness. In fact, if you look at the last verse of chapter 1, look at James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. 
You want to know what real religion, James says? You want to know what that looks like? It looks like visiting those that are in need. It looks like visiting the orphans, visiting the widows, and staying away from worldliness. Now, I don't know what comes to your 2017 mind, your 2017 Seventh-day Adventist mind. Most of you here this morning, Seventh-day Adventist. When, when, when worldly is said, I, I can't even imagine what comes into your mind. But I want to show you what came into James's mind. When James says, keep yourself unspotted from the world, he obviously wasn't talking about don't go to rated R movies because rated R movies didn't exist. He wasn't talking about staying away from internet pornography because internet pornography didn't exist. What does it mean or what did it mean to be worldly in the days of James? We're going to find some of these shoes fit us as well. We're going to talk today about, number one, unethical deference to the rich, judgmental indifference to the poor. James says that's worldly. That's how the world behaves uncritical, uncontrolled and critical speech. He will go on in chapter 3 to talk about earthly, sensual, and demonic wisdom. This is in the whole of his book. He says there's violent and unnecessary quarrels among you. Arguments break out. He even calls them wars that were taking place in the communities of of some of these believers. Selfish pleasure-seeking, that's going to fit us pretty well in 2017. Boastful arrogance. And finally, the undergirding super problem that James really puts his finger on is this double-mindedness toward God. A sort of duplicity as a totally for God or not at all for God or a little bit for God or somewhat for God. So when James writes to those that are scattered abroad, he's like, look, I'm concerned not just that you've moved locations, but you've moved spiritually. You've shifted. And what used to be a solid and robust platform, presumably, from which you could build a good, solid Christian faith, you've shifted. You've shifted, and now there's these worldly influences and situations that are coming upon you. Now, let's go right to James chapter 2. Two, James chapter 2, that should say 2-1, not 1-2. James chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to read a few verses here. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Verse 2, for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should come in another poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes. And you say to him, oh, sit here in this good and honored place. And then you say to the poor man, stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Okay, we're just going to pause right there for a second. Let's walk through a few of these things. The first one here is look at chapter 2, verse 1 in the NIV. My brothers and sisters... Believers in our glorious Jesus Christ must not show, what is the word there? Must not show favoritism. My translation says partiality. Must not show favoritism. Look at the Phillips translation, James 2.1, that should say. Don't ever attempt, my brothers, to combine snobbery with faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Snobbery. Don't think that favoritism or partiality or snobbery can fit with the Christian faith. Can somebody give at least a casual amen to that? Right? And then James, in his fiercely practical, fiercely functional, fiercely ethical way, says, let me give you an illustration. Now, whether or not James is giving an actual situation that would have happened in a local church or a local community, or he's simply inventing a situation that he knows is consistent, he says, just just, just, just imagine with me, a guy comes in, literally in the Greek, he says, with gold fingers, A gold-fingered man, just, it's an exaggeration. Some guy comes in with so many rings on his hand, it's a point of status, it's a point of wealth, it's a point of influence, and that gold-fingered man with shiny clothes, oh, oh, you take him and you put him into the most honored spot in keeping with ancient Near Eastern culture. There were honored places in a feast or honored places in a service or honored places in in an assembly. And then a man comes in literally in the Greek with filthy clothes, filthy clothes, who clearly is just on a different social strata than the gold-fingered man, and you take him and say, well, sit here under my footstool, or actually, we don't even have a place for you to sit. Stand in the corner. So James paints this really practical illustration, and and what James draws out from this is fascinating. He says, when you treat people differently, we're going to spend most of our time here on this today, he says, you're engaging in a kind of religious snobbery. He says, that's worldly. That's the way that worldly people relate. So let's make the most obvious observation to start off with here. Followers of Jesus must not act, speak, or judge based on mere external appearances. We good with that? That's that's clearly the point he's making. Don't treat the gold-fingered man so well and then be dismissive or even unkind to the man who doesn't have the golden fingers, right? And so he says, when you judge based on external appearances, you make a mistake. 
You're behaving how they behave in a worldly context, in a worldly situation. Now, why is that so dangerous? Why is it so dangerous to judge based on external appearances? Why? Let's unpack a little bit of that. Peter Davidson, in the epistle of James, says, True faith has no place for the social distinctions of the world. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe that? Do you believe that's a big, bold statement? True faith has no place, not a little place, not a tiny place, not a very large place. David says, no place for the social distinctions of the world. What kind of social distinctions? Educational distinctions, economic distinctions, career-based distinctions. Now, all of those things, racial distinctions, gender-based distinctions, right? Even religious distinctions. David says, all of those social distinctions that, that find a really happy uh, a place to reside and make their nest in the world, he said, don't bring those in the church. Don't bring the rich, poor, the us and them, the haves and the have-nots, the Joneses and those that are trying to keep up with the Joneses. Don't bring that into the church, he says. Second statement here, this one from Blomberg and Camel's commentary on James. They say, when we attempt to discern people's value based on external features, we not only usurp God's role as judge, but we fail miserably in the process. One of my favorite things to do is when I meet somebody for the first time, especially if it's somebody that I'm going to be having a long-term relationship with or I think I'm going to be having a long-term relationship with them, whether in a church or in a, in a context where maybe I'm going to be work, working with them, I like to, when I meet them for the first time, just, just make a mental note of what my first impression is. And I put it on a shelf in my mind, and I don't know how your mind works, but in, in my mind, if I put something metaphorically on a shelf, I can almost always go back and take it off. So I've learned over the years that I have been so horrifically bad, so inconsistent, so terrible at assessing what people will be like. My first impression is so bad that I've gotten to the place where I take my first impression, put it on a shelf so that I can go revisit it three months, six months, or a year later and see how wrong I was. I'm really, really bad at assessing people just on the external. Probably you are too. Probably you are too. I'm reading a book right now by uh, Nicholas Epsley, or Epsley, I think his name is. It's called Mindwise, How We Misunderstand One Another. And, and we have this sort of way that when we engage people and we encounter them, we're just sure that we know what they're thinking. We're just sure that we know. We, we can size somebody up in moments. Just chick, 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 chick. We can size them up. We can look at the way they're dressed. We can look at the way they carry themselves, the way their hair is combed. We can just, we can just size them up. And what Epsley shows in the book is fascinating social science book, he shows again and again that you're basically only right about 1% more often than just guessing. In other words, you're, you stink at it. We're terrible at it. And then he goes on to say, not only do you not know what's going on in somebody else's mind, you don't really even know very often what's going on in your own mind with accuracy. Right? So this idea that I'm just going to look at somebody, I'm going to size them up, and I say, oh, this gold-fingered man, he's somebody, he's going to be an asset to the church, he's going to be a value to the church, sit right here in the most favored place. Oh, and the stinky man that comes in with the filthy clothes, uh, not a great asset to the church, not somebody that's going to benefit us hugely, sit here in a corner. In fact, don't sit at all, stand. What David is saying and what Blomberg and Camel are saying is that when we do that, we actually place ourselves on the, the throne of judgment, and he says we take God off of the throne who looks not at the outward appearance, but at the, in, at the inward, the heart, and he says we almost always get it wrong. We fail miserably in the process. Let me just give you an example. We've already noted how the people to whom these scattered tribes to whom James is writing are these. They're displaced. They're impoverished. They're persecuted. Now, what kind of a mental landscape would you think that would produce? Humility, deference, acceptance, kindness, but look at the actual language that, that these are different words from the translation of James chapter 2, verse 1. You show partiality, you show favoritism, you, show, you demonstrate snobbery, you act in pre with pretentiousness. Now, that is not something you would have guessed. For people who are displaced and who are themselves in a situation of, of persecution and, and dislocation, you would think that they would be open and available, and yet the way that they're behaving is pretentious and snobby. The reason they're doing it is that they are falling victim to the thing that we all fall victim to, and that is that we tend to give the most attention and the most kindness to the people that we think will benefit us the most. Right? 
You meet somebody, you think, man, I can get something out of this person. You're, you're just kinder. You just gravitate toward those people. If you don't think in an economic relationship that somebody's going to bring you something, our natural inclination is to be less attentive or perhaps even dismissive of those people. James' indictment of, of this particular situation boils down to three basic ideas. He basically says, here's the deal. When you behave with favoritism or pretentiousness, that partiality contravenes God's own evaluation of the people that you think of as them. Us and them. He said, the first problem, James says, that's wrong with that is that that denies God's own call of the poor. Let's continue to read back in James. Come with me back to James. We're in James chapter 2. We've made our way through verse 1. I want to just point out something here in verse 2 that's quite interesting. It says, for if someone should come into your assembly. Now, the word assembly there is literally the Greek word synagogue. If someone should come into your synagogue, and this is where it's very interesting. There are two streams of translation here, two streams. James could be talking about A. We're not quite sure. There's not enough internal evidence to know for certain. Or he could be talking about B. Now, A is a general religious assembly like we're having here this morning. Okay, He might be talking that, or he could be speaking in a very technical term about a gathering, a, a, a sort of courtroom gathering where Christians are coming together to sort out a disciplinary matter. Now, the internal evidence, there's evidence that suggests that the worship context might be right, and there's also internal evidence that suggests that it might be the courtroom matter. Now, the point is, is that neither one affects the overall point that James is making, but there are fascinating, fascinating little nuances that we won't get into right here. What is really clear is that whoever these two visitors are, or whoever these two people are in James' illustration, they're clearly visitors. Visitors either to the general religious assembly or visitors to the courtroom. How do we know they're visitors? Look at the text. How do we know that they're visitors? Again, whether James is describing an actual situation or a purely hypothetical situation, how do we know based on the text that they're visitors? The answer is they're told where to sit. These are not people that are common to this community. These are not people that come in. Many of you, I mean, I can tell you, Seen or Adele, they're going to sit about right there most Sabbaths. They don't have to be shown where to sit, right? And Alex, you're going to be somewhere around there, and your brother's always behind you. I think he likes to keep his eye on you because he's nervous about you, okay? Now, many of you, Blair's going to be right down here. He's going to look at me about two times during the whole sermon, and the rest of the time he's going to have his nose in that Bible. I, I observe you, believe it or not. I, I know the way that you behave. I know the way that you sit. I know those of you that don't pay attention. I know that those of you that are pretending like you're paying attention, and I know those of you that are paying attention, Okay, so, so I don't, if you're a, a regular here, I don't have to tell you where to, you know where to go. But in the illustration, James says, when the gold-fingered man comes in, you say, sit here. And when the filthy-clothed man comes in, you say, sit here. They're visitors, which is a fascinating little insight. Because James is going to use the treatment of visitors. You know where this is going. James is going to use the disparate and the, inequi the, the, the inequitable and the favoritism treatment, favoritist-based treatment of visitors to make his point. And he's not going to say, hey, by the way, that's bad evangelistic philosophy. He's not going to say, hey, you can do better than that. You know what he's going to say? He's going to say, it's evil. He's going to say, that's evil. When somebody walks up to your congregation, whether it's a general worship gathering or into a courtroom setting, when somebody comes in and you deferentially take the gold-fingered man and put him in the favorite spot and the messy-clothed man and you stick him in the corner, he doesn't just say, that's not nice. He doesn't just say, hey, you can do better than that evangelistically. What he says is, you are evil. You're behaving in evil ways. Yikes. Again, fiercely practical fiercely ethical, this guy. It's interesting, the text there that says, verse 1, when you receive someone with partiality, the Greek word literally means when you receive the face. When you receive somebody based on the face, you have committed an evil act. When you assess when you gauge, when you size somebody up, just boom, just like that. We do it all the time. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, that would mean I'm basically evil all the time. You're kind of getting the point. Receiving somebody on the face, 
We know all about this in the Instagram generation, the Facebook generation, the selfie generation. You want to put on your best face. You take 50 photos of yourself, of which 49 you're not going to put up, and then you put up the best one of you because you know, and I know, that in this superficial, ridiculous world in which we live, how your face looks and how you are received is a big deal as to how people will receive you. They didn't have Instagram and Facebook in the days of James, but they could quickly assess, look at your clothes, look at the way you're dressed, look at how you're carrying yourself and size you up. And I'm going to know if I'm going to put you in the standing spot, under the footstool spot, or I say, hey, 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 come with me, come with me, come with me, come with me to the most honored spot. Now, let's jump down to verse 4. James is going to ask three questions, and he assumes that the answer to every one of these questions is yes. It's a rhetorical device where he's asking a specific kind of question, and he wants you to say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Look at it again in verse 4. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Yes, sir. Verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Hasn't he done that? Yes, sir. Third question, verse 6. But now you have dishonored the poor man. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Yes, sir. So in a rhetorical device, James wants to show you the futility of behaving in this external way, this partial way, this inequitable, godless way. So James' indictment is, number one, partiality contravenes God's own evaluation of the poor. He says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hasn't God specifically chosen the poor? Why are you then tr- mistreating the poor and treating favorably the rich? Okay, number two, partiality to the wealthy shows a fawning and unethical and a servile mentality. Oh, sir, can I get you anything? He says, you fawn over these people, and in the context of what we know about the ancient Mediterranean world, landowners were getting more and more land, more and more property, more and more wealth, more and more influence. James will return to this in chapter five. And the poor agricultural labor was being increasingly exploited and oppressed. And he says, why are you going to fawn over the people that drag you into court? Why are you going to fawn over the people that mistreat you? Why are you going to fawn over the people that exploit you? We do something similar back to the Instagram, Facebook age. We don't literally take these people into our churches, but we take these ridiculous celebrities that are famous for nothing other than being famous, and we invite them into our lives. We invite them into our homes. We invite them into our phones. We invite them into our television sets. We just can't stop looking at them. We are doing something very much in keeping with the spirit of what James is talking about here. You're fawning over people that don't care about you. You're fawning over people that are ridiculous and self-serving and self-centered. Then number three, he says partiality, and we're going to get to this in just a second, contradicts the very essence of God's character and God's law of love. For this reason, James is going to say reason number one, number two, number three, as he asks those penetrating rhetorical questions, James is going to say partiality based on external evidence, is fundamentally at odds with God and with religion. Can someone say amen? By the way, just so you can sort of see the tie between chapter 1 and chapter 2, notice how chapter 1 ends. This is what pure religion looks like. This is what real religion looks like to visit the widows and the orphans. Okay? These are people who get no glory. These are people that are going to take time. These are people that are going to be draining. These are going to be people that have needs. He said, religion is hanging out with those people, and this other thing that you're doing where you're fawning over the gold-fingered man who drags you into court, he says, that's ridiculous. The concern that James has, one of the concerns that he has, is that the glory of man is being increased, and the real business end of the church, which is ministering to the poor, is being downplayed. So much cool stuff going on here. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Let's go back to the law of Moses. For Yahweh your God is a God of gods. He's the Lord of lords. He's the great God. He's the mighty and awesome God who, say it with me, who shows no partiality. He doesn't take a bribe. God is not fooled by gold-fingered men or women. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow. Hey, that sounds just like James. That sounds like James. James. It sounds like God is in the business of going to where the need is, not where I can receive, not where I can get, not where I can benefit. 
Continuing on here, verse 18, God loves the stranger. Can somebody say amen? Giving him food and clothing. Therefore, God says, because I love the stranger, you also ought to love the stranger. Don't forget, you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You know what it's like to be on the outside looking in. You know what it's like to be on the outside looking in. We're going to come to that in just a second. Leviticus 19, verse 15. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor, what's the word there? Fairly. Based on the condition of their heart, based on their actions, not based on some external or selfish purpose. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but, and then the best known verse in the Old Testament probably or at least the most important verse in the Old Testament, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. We all know what it's like to be on the outside looking in. Now, there's not a person in this room who hasn't been in some social situation, some professional situation, some familial situation where you have been the outsider. And it sucks. To be on the outside looking in, you feel unwanted, you feel unloved, you feel it hurts. Am I wrong or am I right? Especially if it, if it feels like you're being purposefully made to feel like you're on the outside. I didn't tell him I was going to say this, but I'm just going to use a little illustration from my own family. I have two sons, Landon and Jabel. Landon, as many of you would know, is very socially savvy. He's very confident. He can insinuate himself into almost any group, and he, get along, he gets along with people very easily. There's a certain confidence. A certain, he, he just can insinuate himself, as his father can, into social situations and is not easily intimidated socially. My younger son is also a brilliant young man, but does not possess that same social savvy. And so sometimes he finds it more difficult, like many of you, to... to come into a social situation, a situation where you're, you don't know people, you don't know their names, and you don't have that same sort of confidence that my oldest son has. And, and funnily enough, funnily enough, in my own home, I can see how an external appearance and an external way of conducting yourself actually benefits you socially. And when you come off as a little more difficult or sometimes maybe a little awkward, it actually hinders you socially. Well, why? Why? Well, because we, we cloister ourselves together in these little enclaves, and in, a, in the weirdest counterintuitive way, we actually treat people in a way that we hate to be treated. We hate to be on the outside looking in, but if there's five of us and we're putting somebody else on the outside, we suddenly feel safe. We do things to others that we despise when it's done to us, and it pierces us deeply. It hurts us when we're on the outside looking in. But the converse is also true. Most of us, though not all of us, the first one I can say is every single person. This one I can say is most of us. Most of us do know what it's like to be on the inside looking out at them. And we, not, we need to bear, that hurts them. Rather than saying, hey, hey, come here, what's your name? What? Oh, this is a church that struggles with that. I'll be straight up with you. Straight up with you, this is a church. I've heard it again and again. If I've, I've heard it one time, I've heard it a hundred times. And the thing that's so interesting to me is because I, like my oldest son, have that social confidence, and maybe because I'm the pastor, I just feel like everybody here is really friendly and I can get along with everybody. But the strangest thing, when you talk to people actually in the church, they say, well, you know, I actually find it kind of difficult and I find it kind of unfriendly at times. People maybe aren't like Ruth who can just come in and everybody's your friend. Other people that are sort of over here, that man, I find this church to be slightly unfriendly, and if maybe not downright unfriendly, then a little cold. And the reason is not that people are mean. I, I, I don't think so. In fact, I know every person in this church pretty much, and I, I've not met a mean person yet. I did meet one, but I kicked him out. <laughs> Said, you can go away. You go to another church where they like mean people. So the strangest thing is happening. I'm kidding about that. <laughs> the strangest thing is happening. People are coming into a situation where people aren't being mean, they're just doing what comes natural. That's what was happening with James, but to an extreme. They were just creating social situations where certain people were in and certain people were out. Certain people were in and certain people were out. Now, I don't think, I sure hope not, that people are doing economic distinctions in this church. I've never seen evidence of that. Oh, you're not wealthy enough. You're not smart enough. You're not educated enough. I have not, dis I have not seen that in this church. But what I have seen is that people get into their own social situations and their own social circles, and they're just not brave enough or courageous enough, or maybe they don't have the confidence to just reach outside of that social situation. This isn't everybody, but this is many of you. And say, hey, look, why don't you come here? 
Instead, you, you, most of you call the same people you've been hanging out with your whole lives to go to lunch with. Or you invite the same people you've been hanging out with forever to come over to your house or to come over for dinner. What, what Jesus is going to say is, when you throw a feast, invite the people that most people wouldn't. By the way, there's nothing wrong with hanging out, the people that, hanging out with the people that you know and love. There's a lot right with that. But when you have new people come into a community, the responsibility of the community is not to differentiate them and us. It's to incorporate us. That's hot. That just came to me. It's not to differentiate between them and us. It's to incorporate us. Hey, you're one of us now. That's why these gangs in Southern California and other places can get purchase because they just create a community. Even though it's a terrible community, it's a community based on crime and drugs and all kinds of things, but people feel like they belong. A church should have a much stronger ability to create a sense of community and identity than a godless gang. Somebody could have said amen. God's plan was always bigger and better than us and them. God's plan was just us. In God's world, there is no us and them. In God's world, there's just us. And you've heard me say this before, and you'll probably hear me say it again a thousand times if I'm here for the next 10 years or five years or whatever it is. Notice this. The Lord God said to Abraham, this is the initial covenantal promise, Abram, go from your country, from your people, from your father's household to a land that I will show you. This is God's call of Abram. This is God's answer to the sin of Adam. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And all peoples, how many peoples, everyone? All peoples will be blessed through you. God's plan was not a parochial exclusivity, just the Jews, just the elite, just you to the exclusion. God's plan is like, I'm calling you to bless them. I'm calling you to be a benefit to them. So there isn't an us and a them. There's just an us. Just an us. This is a song that I recently wrote with Josh Cunningham. Many of you know Josh. We're working on a few songs together, and these are the lyrics to a song that we just wrote on this very point, and I couldn't help but share it with you. The song is titled, Us and Them, and it's built around the call of Abraham. The in were out, and the out were in. The wall came down, no us and them. No one need be far away because one has come to save and say, come. Get out, Abraham. Take your household to Canaan. To a land I will reveal through you my promises to fulfill. The promises for everyone through the seed, the blessing comes. The call of Abraham was a call to the incorporation of all of them into the great us. Who are some of those thems? Drunkard, dropout, refugee, hermit, misfit, vagrant, thief, leper, liar, cheater, freak, heavy-hearted, gripped with grief, lonely, loser, drifter, weak, alien, stranger, exile, waif, blind, naked, wretched, slave. Them. Them. But in the Abrahamic call and in the, in the call of Jesus to come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, the in were out and the out were in. Ah, the church should be all about this inclusivity when it comes to community. Not an evil differentiation based on us and them, whether it's economic, professional, social, cool, some nebulous sense of cool. Oh, he's not cool enough. He doesn't cut his hair right. He doesn't have enough Instagram followers or some other pathetic metric by which we color people outside of the lines. And the funny thing is, again, we're all terrified to be outside, but we'll just very easily get together and keep others outside. Oh, man, the human nature is strange, strange and capricious. We've met, mentioned James' indictment before. Of course, Jesus spoke at length about the rich and the poor. Here, James just exudes, again, a, an atmospheric Christianity, a, a, a teaching that just flows from the lips of Jesus. But look at some of the words of Jesus here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The very first words that he spoke in his public ministry, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus here does this really weird thing where he elevates spiritual poverty above spiritual wealth. In the book of Luke, it's not even spiritual. He doesn't even spiritualize it. He just says, blessed are the poor. Man, the poor are so blessed. Theirs is the kingdom of God. When Jesus was asked by the disciples of John the Baptist, John the Baptist was languishing in a pagan prison, and they said, hey, we're not sure this guy's the Messiah. And so they said, go, go see if this guy's the Messiah. And they went and they said, hey, are you the Messiah? Because we're confused about why your elder cousin is still in prison if you're the Messiah. And Jesus' response to them was, go tell John that the poor have the gospel preached to them. They'll know that I'm the Messiah because I'm spending my time with the poor. Jesus told a parable of a rich fool, a man who just added house to house, 
Just, could, just couldn't build enough. Just wanted more barns and more houses. And then the Bible says, you know what he didn't know? He didn't know he was going to die that night. And what did all that accumulation of stuff do for him? He says he's a fool. Man, what a fool. Jesus says in Luke 14, verse 13, when you give a feast, invite the poor. He then tells this great story of the rich man in Lazarus where he uses this really contrasting and exaggerative language to paint a story of a, of a rich man who fared sumptuously every day arrayed in purple, just like the gold-fingered man. And then there was this leper outside covered in sores and the dogs, the unclean dogs came and licked his sores. Jesus purposely paints this really visceral, almost repulsive contrast between the wealthy, well-positioned Jewish man and the seeping, sore leopard at the gate. And then Jesus does this fascinating reversal of fortune. He says that in, in the afterlife, this man with the weeping sores and the dog licking those sores becomes in the very bosom of Abraham, and the wealthy man goes into Hades. Jesus is turning the whole culture of ancient Near Eastern shame culture and ancient Near Eastern socioeconomic culture, he's turning it upside down. The guy who looks like he's shamed goes to the bosom of Abraham, and the guy who looks like he's going to go to the bosom of Abraham ends up in Hades. Three more of these quickly as Jesus speaks about the poor and the rich. Jesus says, sell what you have and give to the poor. That's what he said to the rich young ruler. Give it to the poor, man. What do you need all that stuff for? When Zacchaeus, as soon as Zacchaeus is converted, when Jesus comes to his house, what does he say? Look, Lord, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. It's inescapable. It's in, and we whinge about a 10% tithe. Man, I'm just on this tithe thing right now. Just like tithe. By the way, you are not making a decision whether or not to return tithe. That's not the decision you're making. The, the decision is not, should I return tithe or not? The decision you're actually making is, should I be a thief or not? That's the decision you're making. You, know, you don't decide to give back to God what's not yours. He said, you know what? We, we decided to return tithe. Well, good for you. What you actually decided to do was stop being a thief. The 90% is yours. He said, man, I got my 90%. Anybody in show business would love that deal. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. My manager and my record company and my tour manager, all of that, they only get 10% and I get 90%? Oh, come on. That's a great deal. Talk to anybody in show business, talk to anybody in music, talk to anybody in the arts, man, the 90%, 10%, that's a good deal. In fact, the 90% is the beginning of your generosity, not the end of it. If the 90% is the end of your generosity, you're not very generous. I'll be straight up with you. You're not very generous at all. And if you're starting at 100%, don't even, don't, you're a thief. You're a thief, Right? You start with that 90% there. When Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was converted, he's like, man, if all of heaven would empty itself into the Messiah, I'm going to give half. I'm going to give half. I'm not saying you have to give half. You get whatever the Spirit lays on your heart. But don't come to me and, oh, I'm a good Adventist. Da, 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 da. And I ask you the question, are you returning a faithful tithe? You say, no, you're a thief. I wasn't planning on saying that, so somebody must have needed to hear that. Number nine, Jesus said, this poor widow put in more than they all. You just can't escape it. Jesus not only didn't make a differentiation between the wealthy and the poor, Jesus often cited and aligned himself with the poor. In fact, I'm going to show you something really cool on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, speaking of the early church, the early church was not growing among the uber wealthy and the uber influential. Paul says, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. We don't have that many big Hitters in the church is what he's saying. We don't got a lot of celebrities in the church. We're not, we're not winning Kardashians to the church. And we're not winning the Oprah Winfrey's to the church. We're not winning the big shots to the church. Who are we winning? Well, it doesn't matter because God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things that are mighty. He's chosen the base or the low things of the world. These are the things, the things that the world despises God has chosen, like the orphan and the widow, the poor, filthy, clothed man, that no flesh should glory in his presence, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. It's not without coincidence that James chapter 2 verse 1 begins with, we worship Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. See, what's happening here is that the church... In, in James' time, these scattered groups were giving all of this glory to gold-fingered men and men of in influence, and no, no real, inf no real uh, position or influence to those who were filthy or poor. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. 
The glory that we care about is the glory of Jesus. The poor are not blessed. We have to say this. The poor are not blessed because they are poor, and the rich are not cursed because they are rich. That's not true. I am of this decided opinion that if, God had, if, if the rich young ruler had said, you want me to sell everything that I have and give to the poor, I think Jesus, and he would have said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it right now. I think Jesus would have said something like, you don't have to, but you need to be willing to. Now, let's use those resources. Let's use those monies that you have to do something bigger than getting you a fancy car or a new suit. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, I, listen, I would love to drive something other than a 1999 Nissan Pulsar that the transmission is going out on. I would. But, but just to be totally honest with you, not to celebrate myself here, I just have things that are more important. Right? I just love this idea here that it's not because you're poor that you're blessed, and it's not because you're rich that you're not blessed. No. What happens is, and this might sting a little bit, because most of you in this room are fantastically wealthy on the global scale. Fantastically wealthy, most of you in this room, on the global scale. And some of you are wealthy even by Australian standards. But on the global scale, most of us in this room, fantastically wealthy. Right? So here's an interesting thing. The problem is, is that poverty correlates with neediness. So that's what the, what the word means, to be, to be in need. And when you're in need, you don't just look to governments for help. You know what? You, you start to set your eyes a little higher. You start to look to God for help. And when you have six figures in the bank, seven figures in the bank, and you're driving a sweet new whip, woo! you don't need Jesus. In fact, it's quite interesting. Statistically, wealth correlates negatively with religiosity. Here's a little, little slide that's not easy to see, but I'll just put it up there for you. You might be able to see some of this. So what you have on the left axis there is religiosity by national declaration. These are the countries that are the most religious. From the bottom, the least religious to the top, most religious. In the upper right-hand corner, you have the 16 most religious nations in the world. Ghana, Nigeria, Armenia, Fiji, Kenya, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Pakistan, Georgia, Uzbekistan, India, Cameroon, Peru, Macedonia, and Brazil. And what you see is all of those nations are up here. Lowest income, highest spirituality. Now, as you move along this axis here, the horizontal axis, you're getting more and more wealthy. This is per capita, annual per capita income in U.S. dollars. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, say, here's Australia right here. Low religiosity, high income. That's on average, right? So what happens is, as you go out this way, you go down this way. Now, there are some exceptions. The United States is a bit of an exception. It tends to have reasonably high religiosity, 60%, but is actually in advance even of Australia out here. In fact, it's the third wealthiest here, only behind Switzerland and Hong Kong. Now, now if, you, if all you knew, if all you knew was this chart, was this chart, and you said, you know what? I just want to be saved. I just want to spend eternity with Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Where do you want to be from? Switzerland? You want to be from Australia? Or do you want to be from Uzbekistan? See, now, you're laughing. You're chuckling. Because many of you are just so happy to be in Australia. And, and I'm happy to be in Australia, too. And I'm happy to be an American that lives in Australia. Uh, uh, but I'll tell you this. It's actually working against us. It doesn't mean that Australians aren't going to be saved. It doesn't mean that Americans aren't going to be saved. It doesn't mean that the Swiss aren't going to be saved. It means that it's working against us. We have to be vigilant about the fact that we live in a culture where we got kind of what we want. We have money. We have resources. We have income. And statistically, there are so many studies that confirm again and again and again, there is a precipitous drop-off in interest in religious things as money goes up. I have a friend. I have a friend whose mother suddenly and unexpectedly came into a small sum of money, about $300 million. It's a personal friend of mine. And uh, his mom came into about $300 million bucks. And no, I had this conversation with him probably six years ago. He's a dear friend. He teaches at Arise. And um, he told me, he says about 15 years after she had come into this money, she said, worst thing that ever happened to our family. Let that settle in. Worst thing that happened to our family was that we got suddenly, unexpectedly, $300 million. He said, take all the problems in your family and multiply them by whatever, however many zeros there are there. I mean, is it a million problems now, or do you have 10 million problems? Or do you now have 100 million problems? Most of us would think, man, a cool, I'd take a cool 100 million. In fact, just make it 10. Make it a sweet 10 million, and you think that would be a good thing for you. Statistically, now I'm, I'm not saying this would be the case in your case, in your specific case, in the instantiation that is you, but statistically speaking, if I could just right here miraculously gift $10 million to every one of you, it would statistically ensure that some of you 
would be lost. In fact, more of you would be lost than would be saved if you didn't get the 10 million. Statistically. So you can begin to understand, and James wouldn't have even had access to these de this demographic data, but James could see what we can all see, that, that when you have needs and when you don't know if you're going to have enough money at the end of the week, you don't, you got to go, Lord, I, I'm afraid there's going to be more month than money. When you know there's going to be more money than month, what are you praying about? You might pray. But you don't have to pray. But if you don't have clean water to drink or a house to sleep in or you have four generations of people living in a two-room hut, you're going to pray. You are going to pray. For those of us like Leon and myself, and I'm so happy to hear Leon in the back giving an enthusiastic yes, for those of us that have traveled extensively to some of the poorer regions of the world, man, we know. The shoes are worn out, but the smiles are big and the amens are fierce. Now, they have to have a connection with God. I have to. I have to. All right. This is why God's plan is way better than us and them, and His plan is just us. Here's a cool little play on words that I came up with this morning. I hope you like it. God has the Abrahamic plan, the just us plan, not the gold-fingered man and the filthy-garmented man. God has the just us plan, and I thought this was kind of cool. Maybe you'll like it. When there's just us, James says, that creates justice. When there's just us, and we're not going to differentiate based on religion, we're not going to differentiate based on money, we're not going to differentiate based on professionalism, we can really be just because we can just treat people like the situation calls for, not take a bribe, not in, in, endear ourselves to somebody in a way that... It, it, ah, when there's just us, then there can be justice. Leviticus 19.15, we've already quoted this. Do not pervert justice. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know as I know that that was the center of the ethical teaching of Jesus. Hey, what's the great commandment in the law? Jesus is like to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Zechariah chapter 7, 9 and 10 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, hosts execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion Everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless. Notice how that comes up again and again. The alien or the poor. Don't oppress those people. Don't take advantage of those people. Don't exploit those people, James says to his church. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. Now let's read the last few verses here at James and then land this. He's already asked his three rhetorical questions. Then we read verse 8 to 13. If you really want to fulfill the royal law, I love that, according to, the script, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Oh, I like that. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. He doesn't just say you're not nice. He says you're an evildoer and you commit sin. You are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Because, James says, whoever will keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Because the same God that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become, again, a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those that will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Wow, it's great stuff here. He says, if you, commit, if you break one, you might as well break all of them. Why? Well, for James, the unity and thus the indivisibility of the royal law derived from God's own nature. God is one. And therefore, there is not, there's not a distinction between what some of the rabbinical Jews called the weightier matters of the law and the lighter matters of the law. God's indivisibility, his uni, unibody construction, if you will. Douglas Moo taps into this. The undivided nature of God is especially important to James because it stands in direct contrast to the deepest problem of human beings. What is that problem, Dr. Moo? Well, it's their tendency to be divided in their loyalties, wavering between God and the world. That's the big problem that we're facing. The problem we're facing is not an economic problem. The problem we're facing is, is we just don't know how much energy to give to God. And God's like, well, how about this? Just give me 100%. You're negotiating with me. But you give me 100%. Jesus said it like this. I'll tell you how much I need. Take up your cross. That's 100%. That's all in. And what, what Moose says is, what James is saying is, 
the main problem that underlies human uh, frailty and human sin and human transgression is a dividedness between a little bit or a lot. How much does God get? God's royal law is distinguishable. Yes, there's a command that says do not commit adultery, and there's also a command that says do not kill, but that law is not divisible. I love this. If you read through the first ten, four of the Ten Commandments, you basically get this really cool picture. The first commandment, God says, have no other gods before me. God says, I want your affections. A woman at a wedding says, do you take this, uh, the preacher says, do you take this woman to have and to hold? Do you take this man to have and to hold? You say, give me your affections. God then says in the second commandment, don't make a graven image and don't bow down to it. With what do we make and with what do we bow? The answer is your body. God then says, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. With what do we take God's name in vain? With our mouth, with our words. And then he says, remember the Sabbath day, which is fascinating. If you look at the first four commands, what you have right there is God says, give me your affections, give me your body, give me your words, give me your time. And that right there is the basis of all spousal relationships. If your relationship is struggling with your spouse, or if you don't yet have a spouse, you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, girlfriend or maybe you're thinking about it at some point in the future, that, it's right there. Affections, body, words, time. Because what's happening at Sinai is God is entering into a royal covenantal relationship with Israel. I'm going to skip a couple things here. Not because they're unimportant, because I just want to get to the punchline. Okay. Oh, yeah, here we go. Never forget that God's law, the Ten Commandment law, the royal law was given to a free people. Before God ever says, you shall have no other gods before me, he says, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The law is not given to an enslaved people. The law is given to a free people. They're free. He doesn't say, if you live like this, I'll make you free. What he says is, you're free, now live like this. Big difference. Huge difference. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You're free now. You're free from Egyptian bondage. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be again burdened by a yoke of slavery. Look at the language that James uses. He says the law of liberty. The law of liberty. That's why I called this sermon the poor rich and the liberated lawful. The people that, that, that say I'm going to stand on the law and in this really weird counterintuitive paradox, when you actually take on restrictions, you become free. Here's a really good example. When you marry somebody, you take on a massive restriction, right? When I married Violetta, I said, you're the one. I know there are billions of other women that could potentially be available, but I'm taking on a giant restriction here. I'm taking you, and a really crazy thing happens. When I limit myself to one, I'm free. I'm free. And so this crazy idea that we have that, oh, if I could just be free, and that's the world that we're living in right now, that Australia doesn't know what to do, the Australian government doesn't know what to do, the American government doesn't know what to do, all of these first world countries are spiraling out of control. They don't know what to do because they're just jettisoning the shackles, oh, oh that marriage thing, oh, religion, oh, Christianity, oh, Judaism, we're charging into the brave new world, we're going to do this based on secular humanism. The problem is they're driving a car off a cliff, they don't know where it goes. They're driving the car right off the cliff, man. Because they think that the way to have true freedom is to get rid of all shackles of restraint, all shackles of covenantal commitment, all shackles of traditional, for example, versions of marriage and family. It's like, okay, you can just keep throwing those shackles off. What you're going to find is it doesn't make you free. It enslaves you to your vices. God gives law to create liberty. Woo! The law of liberty. Come on. Ellen White says in God's Amazing Grace, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that law of Ten Commandments of the greatest love that can be presented to man is the voice of God speaking to the soul in promise. In promise. This do and you will not come under the dominion and control of Satan. Oh, so you think, oh, I'm throwing off shackles of religion. I'm throwing off shackles of traditionalism. You think you're going to be free. You're going to be in bondage to yourself and to s Satan. There is not a negative, she says, in the Ten Commandments, although it may look that way. And one of the brightest and best minds that I am personally aware of, Dr. Richard Davidson at the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary, who knows more Hebrew than he knows English, he says that in the Hebrew language, there is not a negative imperative. There is no, you will not, in Hebrew. I know that's how your Bible reads. You will not commit adultery. You will not steal. You will not bear false witness. Davidson says that is not how that should be translated. There's not even a negative imperative construction grammatically in the Hebrew. It should say, you will no longer. You will no longer have other gods. You will no longer murder. You will no longer steal. 
the promise that you're free now. You're free. In obedience to their King Jesus, Christians are to build among themselves a genuine counterculture in which the values of the kingdom of God rather than the values of this world are lived out. And this is where it ends. I love that language. A counterculture. A counterculture. What that means is that the culture is all going this direction. And from its beginning, Christianity was a counter movement. It said, whoa, the Roman, Greco-Roman world's going that way. We're going this way. We're going this way. Which is why the early Christians, believe it or not, were called cannibals and atheists. They were called cannibals. Why were they called cannibals? Because they ate the body and blood of somebody. And they were called atheists because they denied all of the state gods. So all of Greco-Roman culture is going this way. And here's this Christian counterculture that says, we'll see you later. We think you're going off a cliff. We're going to go this way. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus called his disciples to himself. They said, fellas, 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 come here. This is right after James and John's mom came up and said, hey, 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 Jesus. I got a question for you. Yeah, what is it? Hey, can I have one of my sons sit on your right hand and one of your sons sit on the left because they can rule way better than those other 10 jokers? I, I, I need these guys to occupy a high hierarchical position. And Jesus is like, it's not going to be like that. Then he calls his disciples up and says, hey, 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 <laughs> fellas, come here. I know what you think. You think the one that's over is actually better off. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are the greatest exercise authority over them. But it will not be this way among you. That's a great opportunity to say amen. That's okay, you missed it. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be the servant. Let him be the servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be the slave. When James introduces himself to us, he says, James, a slave of Jesus. You want to be the top? Be the bottom. You want to be the ruler? Be the slave. Just as the son of man, hey, I'm, I came down from glory, my friends. I possess all the resources of omnipotence, omniscience, and omnibenevolence. And I came down to wash your stinky feet and to die on a Roman instrument of torture to save your sorry souls. You want to be great? You come to serve. Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is it. You made it. What I'm passionate about, what I see James being really passionate about here is he's writing to a church, a group of scattered communities that are losing their spiritual moorings. I wonder if some of us are losing our spiritual moorings. I think a little adversity could suit us really well. Be good for us. Might, might help us out a little bit if the culture's all running this way. If some of us say, you know what? We're, we're a Seventh-day Adventist community. We're a Bible-believing community. We're going to go this way. If all the culture is going to run that way, we're going to go this way. Let's really sink our teeth. Church, let's sink our teeth. Let's roll up our sleeves and, and get into this beautiful and biblical notion of an authentic counterculture. Where we don't judge based on external appearances, where we don't color people outside of the lines because of their race, because of their color, because of their economic income, because of their professional profile, because of their status, some imagined cool status. Now, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's sink our teeth into what counterculture looks like, where godly mercy triumphs over misjudgment. Godly mercy. When it says mercy triumphs over judgment, what it means is not only that God's mercy triumphs over God's judgment, uh, justice, but, but also this idea that when you treat people with kindness and with deference and you assume the best about them, if you err on the side of mercy rather than on the side of criticism, a really cool thing happens. Everybody benefits. If, if everybody's invited to sit at the cool kids' table, it's a win for everybody. Let's just have everybody sit at the cool kids' table. Wouldn't that be awesome? A church where there isn't an us and a them. A community where there isn't an us and a them. A community where we don't really care how many zeros are in your bank account. I got a lot of zeros in my bank account. They're just after the decimal point. I got so many zeros, you'd be jealous. Where godly mercy triumphs over misjudgment, where freedom and love are found for everyone. Can the church say Amen. The law of liberty and truly loving your neighbor as yourself. Last slide, and where Jesus is worshipped and obeyed as king. The concern that James has is a concern that with some modern modification I have for my own church. And that is that, that we not 
allow ourselves to take God off the throne and go sit on the throne and do the judging that God is uniquely qualified to do. Amen? Friends, let's not judge based on external appearances. Let's not do that. Let's not treat people differently because they're not us. In fact, let's just jettison this whole ridiculous notion of us and them. How about just a giant us? How about a, a giant Abrahamic us? All of us, us. Men, women, male, female, rich and poor, slave and bond. All of us as a part of us. And so when we come in, we don't have to worry about a differentiation between the in crowd and the out crowd. And the out crowd and the in crowd. We can say, you know what? There's a place at the cool kids table for everybody. Everybody can sit at the cool kids table because the cool kids table is the table of Jesus. And Jesus says it's not the table of lording. It's not the table of mastery. It's the table of servanthood. It's the table of humility. It's a table where everybody can come. If you just say, look, I want to be a blessing. I want to serve. I don't want you to come and serve me. It's not about what I can get. It's about what I can give. And Jesus gave his life as a ransom. And if he gave so much, what little bit can we give. Father in heaven, it is so little that we return. Father, when it comes to that thing that is nearest and dearest to many of our hearts, money, oh, we struggle, many of us, to write that 10% check. Woo! And the idea that we might do like Zacchaeus and give half of our income is unthinkable because so many of us, Father, are living right up to and then beyond our financial means. We don't have any, wait, wait, how could we give any money to the poor, to the church, to the mission? Man, we're tapped. Father, the prayer of my heart for all of us is that we'll ask ourselves the big questions. Am I tapped out financially because I'm so generous to the poor, to the widow, to the afflicted, to the orphan, to the persecuted, to the dislocated? Or am I tapped out because I just had to have that latest and greatest, newest, best widget? Father in heaven, may we become an intensely generous community, and not just generous our, with our money, but generous with our time, generous with our attitude, generous with our treatment of others. Father, may mercy triumph over judgment in the Kingscliff Church. May mercy triumph over judgment in our hearts, and may mercy triumph over judgment in your global church, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen.